Hey, fearless fundraisers, it's time to buckle up for a new episode of Raise Nation, the one and only podcast made to inspire fundraisers like you to continue making impact in our communities, building better tomorrows, and exchanging ideas. So whether you're a trailblazer or seasoned pro, you'll pick up the trends that transform your fundraising. And together, we'll dive into lively conversations and chat with industry-leading fundraisers and thought leaders to explore hot-button issues and innovative ideas. So stay with us for the next 30 minutes while we inspire you to embrace the future of fundraising. So let's get going. Um, before we introduce our guest, I'd like to turn it to my co-host, who I've been enjoying Raise Nation Radio with for the past uh, couple of days. Mr. Ben Farrell, are you out there with us today? Absolutely, Don. Excited to be here. Great conversation coming up. I'm just going to go out and say we got a five star, multi five star reviewed uh, speaker here. I mean, full of energy, just what we like to hear, just what we like to see, just how we like to learn, Don. I'm excited to jump right in and get this going. Yeah, I'm super excited, too. Do you know how many five star reviews we got? Above well, last count was below 50. Let's let's go there. Do you think it's above or below 50? Oh, it's above 50. That's a fact. That's a fact. 90. 90. 90 five-star reviews. Very exciting. Yes, oh. excellent. And all well and, and well deserved, no doubt. Yeah, I heard there was a little song that went along with it too. So without further ado, why don't we jump right to introducing our guest. I'm super, super excited because I think he's going to, you know, help us get some subscribers on our podcast. Um, it was just amazing to hear his session yesterday. And that is true. 90 star, star, five star reviews. So I'm so super pleased to introduce Mr. Patrick Kirby from Do Good Better Consulting. And I just love everything about everything that he did. So Hello, Patrick. We're, we're so happy to have you. Ben and I can't wait to jump in and get some conversation going. How are you doing this morning? I am wonderful. I'm coming off the high of uh, getting off of a, a virtual stage. And um, it is, I, you forget how exhausting it is to put, you know, sort of energy and effort into like just 90 whole minutes of a grind of just, you know, uh, topic after topic after topic. <clears throat> you get back, you sit back and you're like, <sighs> That was awesome. And then, like you just said, the response has been so wonderful. I've been so humbled by people reaching out and saying, yes, I want to learn more. And, hey, I want to do this. Or, hey, you've inspired me to do this. Uh, so any more information that I can give, any more inspiration that I can uh, spread here on the podcast, thank you so much for having me on as a guest. Oh, gosh, it's our pleasure. Uh, I, I think one of the, the best things that I love that you say is um, – how much you don't like, we've always done it that way before, right? So it's, I'd love for you to expand on that. Why is just that, um, that's the most dangerous phrase in the English language? We've always done it that way before. Why is that so dangerous? Well, I think for two reasons. Number one, um, those up and coming fundraising uh, rock stars have ideas and motivations and perspectives that really are going to change the way that organizations can fundraise for the better, right? They've got a different way of communicating. They've got sort of a more relatable to another generation of, of fundraisers in the, in, you know, sort of in the hopper. Right. Um, and, and what can happen a lot of the times is the old guard or those who have done it forever in certain ways will sort Hey, slow down, kiddo. Uh, we got to just kind of work on how we're going to integrate this rather than embracing and doing. And that pause stops the momentum, which then breeds sort of this, well, then I can't make an impact. And then they kind of go back into their shell. You know, these, these wonderful, talented individuals, they go back into their shell and they just kind of do, and they just kind of slide through. So without, you know, saying yes, and in, in sparking that enthusiasm and saying, you know what, maybe the way that we've done it, it has not been the best. And let's try something new without embracing that. I think a lot of organizations just uh, stall and they get old and stale, and then the and that and that breeds into everything from marketing to to solicitations to events, everything. Uh, it just becomes blah. And if you become blah, and somebody else is doing something great, you're always playing catch up rather than being on the forefront of something new and exciting and awesome. And and that's why doing the same thing over and over again is 
really, it, it's just kind of blase. It's kind of uh, horrible. So that's number one. And number two, I always think the status quo, and this is just sort of me as an internal rebel, as most things, the status quo is never something we should always strive to do. We should always strive to do uh, better. We should always strive to do more. And um, that's why I think anyone who is sort of hammering home the way we've always done it is a good way of doing it is a, is a super dangerous from creativity and productivity. Oh, man. You're not talking radical change, right? You're not, you're not saying that it has to be radical change. You're just saying that if we keep doing something the same way all the time, we're going to have the same results. And just always doing it this way, well, we need to be a little bit more open-minded. And, and do you cover this in your book? I, I think you have an Amazon bestseller. Is it called Fundraise Awesomer? Is that right? Do you cover yeah. some of that in your book? It is. Yeah. And I think it's part of the, it's, it's framing out ways that you can sort of move the needle forward in any sort of way that you can. And so, the, and moving the needle forward is a way to kind of chip away at what you've always done uh, over and over again, right? It's trying something new in small segments so that you can kind of build momentum and stack it on top of each other. Um, so yeah, I do I do touch on that on the on the book. And yeah, you're right. I'm not proposing to burn everything to the ground. That would be ridiculous, right? There are some best practices out there from from mailers and physical mail and and social media best practices that need to be done in order to build some of that momentum. But it's that hanging on for dear life because we've always done it attitude that really breeds resentment and it doesn't grow enthusiasm and uh, and sort of uh, outside of the box thinking that needs to happen in the nonprofit world. If there's a one uh, sort of uh, industry that needs to be on the forefront, it's nonprofits because everything's changing so quickly and old organizations and old thought processes can't catch up once they get blown past uh, everything else. Well, great point, Patrick. And I got to tell you from a fundraising events person perspective, something as simple as when we rearrange the ballroom, this is some event that we were working that had uh, t- over 25 years of experience. We put the stage instead of on the side wall, on the vertical wall, and people came in. We love what you've done with this place. Even the smallest improvement or change can, can make a difference. And I'll go back to my uh, early years when mobile bidding first arrived. Oh, my goodness. The naysayers, well, we didn't need any mobile bidding back in 1970 when we had a record-breaking event. And uh, they say, there's no way that a group of adults will be in a ballroom, everyone on their phone. Well, (laughs) of course they are. And um, I think that uh, I just want to follow up on what you said, which is the most important part, which is stifling that creativity process. When you're getting together and you have to embrace, you have to encourage and give someone the space to just share a creative idea because it's it's amazing what people can come up with. And it's led to, of course, big growth in fund and need, big growth in gamification, interactive games at fundraising events. And how about the success of online events. I mean, we're in this transition period, so I'm eager to hear with the groups you're talking to this transition where people are eager to get back in person, but we just witnessed an amazing session by you that was offered virtually with full engagement, full participation. You left energized, the attendees left energized, so it is absolutely possible. So how are you helping people make their decision on navigating back in person or the blending of online and in person? Uh, the, the first two questions I um, ask any organization I work with or talk with is, what's the purpose of your event? Because it's got to be either be a friend raiser or a fundraiser. And now they can be a little bit of both, but they got to be one or the other. And the reason is, is because your attitude and your creativity and how you curate that event is totally different. If it's just a friend raiser, if it's just somewhere that you can get your name out and it's just trying to build momentum in the community and invite people to learn about your mission, that's great. You don't necessarily have to concentrate on building, uh, you know, sort of fundraising arm or this and that. You can get great speakers and talk about impact. And that's really what your goal is. If it's a fundraiser. And then you've got to, uh, you know, concentrate on the fundraising things. Should you have a ticket price? Yes. Should you have things to, uh, should you expect to give money? Yes. Should you make asks? Yes. Like there are a lot of the things you have to do at a 
fundraiser. Otherwise, you won't raise the funds to do, and it won't be worth it. Your ROI won't be worth it. So a lot of the first conversations is, what on earth do you want to do? And then from there, it's, okay, let's gauge, let's gauge your audience. Do you know who your donors are? Are they older? Are they more susceptible to, to, to a viral outbreak? Are they, are they uh, sort of an older generation of things? What is that look like? And if that's the case, well, then you may want to consider not having an in-person event because here's the thing. We raised so much money virtually in the last uh, year and a half. So much money you reached so many more people. And if you told me, and this is Ben, this is a question that I would often pose to uh, organizations. I think you'll appreciate this is if I told you that your event had 150 more attendees than last year, and then I told you, you're going to put on that same event, but then 150 more people won't show up. In fact, the 150 that did show up won't show up. Are you going to be like enthusiastic about having an in-person event because you just lost 150 of your best rock stars? You reached people from all across the country and the globe. And you're going to tell me that that wasn't worth the logistical uh, sort of heavy lifting on the front end to have the benefit of having your mission in the hearts and minds of those across that you would never have from down the street. That's insanity to me. So what I really try to tell people is yes, that in-person hugs and high fives are so important to making you feel great. But from your mission, from your mission, getting your word out and getting exposure to people who don't necessarily know who you are, but might fall in love with you. Why get rid of that? Ah! Oh, I 100 percent agree. I mean, we are speaking the same language. Never before have people been able to tune in, have a voice, feel like they're participating, do it from the comfort of their home, still contribute to a cause they care about, still be inspired by first person testimonials, videos and more, uh, and still do it with a community of people they care about, their friends, their neighbors, their colleagues, their loved ones, absolutely full on participation. And uh I, you know, I tell remind people sometimes I can remember about 2018, Patrick, maybe you heard this too, these rumblings, you know, maybe people are getting tired of these in-person, maybe it's too much to have another gala. Maybe we should just do some sort of replacement event. Well, <laughs> now people are like, we must be back in person. We must, I'm just saying it's possible. I certainly witnessed it. You've witnessed it. And here's a familiar phrase that we hear over and over and over again, um, which is for sure, our net profits were up. Now, in some cases, our gross profit was down, but our net was up. Our net yep. was up. We just netted more money with this online event. And yep. so why not continue with absolutely what's working? Because donors, and let me know if you've experienced this too, donors are appreciating the fact that nonprofits and charities are hosting events. They appreciate that they're making this effort. They welcome the opportunity to give. And they're certainly not being critical of where and how they're meeting with their charities. Yes. And here's the thing. They want to give. They don't care how and where and when they want to give. They want to be asked. They want to be aligned and they want to give. And so it doesn't matter if it's in person. Some You don't need 48 Coors Lights to tell me that I believe that this charity is worth my dollar amount. It helps. <laughs> it's fun. But I don't need it as a donor. And I think that's what we have to get through our heads is that yes, this is not a fluke. This is the future. And the, and the way that you think about this from, a, from an event planning brain, you have to think, how do I plan this virtually first? Because if you think about it, and like I'm going to have a six hour online fundraising event with a gala and drinks and people are going to sit on the TV. No, they aren't. People have the attention span of gnats. So you need to make sure that your entertainment is great. The energy is high. You keep things short and you want to do this thing where I, I know I found this in my uh, before I was married in the dating life. In fact, I throw I found this in into meetings and parties. Leave them wanting a little bit more. Don't leave everything on the table and make them bored and wish you left early. Leave early and go, God, that was super fun. I can't wait till the next time. So keep it short. Keep it, um, keep it awesome. Throw everything you have at entertaining and educating and showing impact and asking for money and then stop and then just go. And it's the same theory that you do when you ask people for money, major gifts or small gifts or whatever. You make the asks and you shut up. Same thing with the virtual event, right? You make the ask, you say, congratulations, that's awesome, and be done. 
because that feeling of like, wow, that was just a wild ride on a roller. You don't want to ride a roller coaster for four hours. You want to ride it for 40, <laughs> you want to ride it for two minutes and then take a deep breath and go, God, that was fun. Absolutely. The same thing. So what is it, Patrick? What do you, what is the paralysis? Cause we, we spoke earlier today and we're like, we are all connected. We may not be in a room together where we can hug and kiss and have the 48, you know, Coors Light beers, but we are connected. We're just connected yeah. through, a, you know, a different, a different channel. So what is it about the digital world or digital communications or digital engagement that paralyzes fundraisers and what can they do to overcome that 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 paralysis because you're right i mean you don't you don't want to have a six hour event in person you don't want to have a six hour event online either so so where does the paralysis come from and how do we overcome it so that we can be just as fluid and successful in would it regardless of what the connection vehicle is if, if it is zoom if it is you know um a virtual event center, you know, from powered by one cause, it, it, whatever it, it, the channel is, where's the paralysis coming from and how do we overcome that? Think like a Netflix producer. Netflix producer. Think okay. Like Netflix, Netflix producer. <laughs> think like a, a, someone who is, uh, you know, find somebody in, in theatrics or theater and, and, and write it like a TV show, right? We've been sitting on the couch watching Amazon prime for the last two years and yep, Amazon be. prime, you aren't watching Every episode isn't four hours long, right? They're 30 minutes, they're 40 minutes, they're little chunks of time where you have the paying attention to. So you have to think about that. You have to think about a start and a beginning and an end. You have to think like people consume media currently and do it in a way that if you would be entertained, then they would be entertained. This square peg round hole thing is such a paralyzing uh, bit for nonprofits because they think they need to take all of their in-person stuff and jam it into a virtual event. And that's not what you do. You start over from scratch and you think, what do I want them to walk away with feeling? That's the first thing you think about. And then how do you build everything around that? Did you want them to feel inspired? Did you want them to feel motivated? Did you want them to feel um, um, uh, chaos that the only way that they can help is through a donation? Did you want to make them feel sad? What is that? What do you want them to walk away with? And then build your event around the emotion that you want them to leave with so that your next step, and this is so important for event planners in the virtual world, your next step on what you do afterward is exponentially more important than what you do night of. The things you do prior to are way more important than night of because you are building this as it's just an event. But what you do afterwards, the thank yous, the follow ups, the conversations, the relationship buildings, that's what matters. You're using this event as a catalyst to begin those conversations or continue them. But it's just an event. And if you can get that through your brain to start with your creative um, process, then you win. You win hands down. That's it's a great after. Right. Yeah. Isn't so, that amazing, Ben? So, it's I'm a sorry, great, great ahead. point. It's a great point. We've always really uh, looked at events as a launching point, a launching to building these relationships, leading to deeper relationships, better connections, always as the beginning, not the end. You know, yeah, so many times you'll see the, the event is over. People are like, whew, I don't have to worry about this until next year. Well, this is actually day one of the process. So yes. you want to begin. And as you were talking about the timing and mapping out an online event, reminded me of Daniel Pink's great book called When, uh, the importance of timing, the science of timing. And he, they have studied people. They realized they, they looked at a funny thing. They looked at Yelp reviews and all those people who are complaining were usually complaining about this last thing that happened to them at the restaurant. Yes. And so I say, whenever you're planning, no matter what you're doing, let's make sure we are finishing big, big with inspiration, big with a call to action, a big of forging ahead, go forth and prosper. And uh, what, what a difference that can make. So what have you seen for those listening in some great ways to kind of conclude their online event where people are just charging out the door ready to take action. Right. I know I'm a big proponent and a big fan of um, ending the night on a fund to need and then a big hurrah. And we did what we set out to do and look at what we accomplished and, and how you do that and how you do that successfully is make sure that all your gifts or most of your gifts are already in the hopper. You've already had conversations with donors about soliciting and being there and raising their virtual hand or their paddle or their committing a gift so that your heavy lift prior to the event 
is just a celebration of all the hard work that you did to inspire those that may not have the financial capacity to participate at a level that that some of these individuals that you already had conversations with, Ken, but they were inspired to give any small amount that contributed to the larger good. And then you celebrate that. And Kate, this is what we're about to do with your gifts. We're about to go out and clothe the naked. We're about to, uh, you know, shelter the homeless. We're about to feed all of those who are hungry. And we did it with your gifts. Imagine what we can do together going forward. We can't wait to share with you the successes that you've helped us make. And we'll see you next year. And that's it. And then you just go. And, and I think that momentum that you build, you build this giant wave of enthusiasm and momentum to the event, and you just capture it there. There's no need to ramp down and, and just waste time doing X, Y, and Z afterwards. You've already had your crescendo. Why waste any more time with the, with the final joke or the final number or the final music act? Right? That, that's it, right? Every band you've ever seen closes with the song that made them the most popular ever, right? I want to see Guns N' Roses, but I damn well want to see, uh, you know, Welcome to the Jungle, or I want to see Paradise. I want to see that at the end. I want to remember them for just going, you know, balls to the wall, the last song. I don't want to see, and I want to hear, oh, we're going to do an encore, and they play something new. Get, no, I want to go to my car now. But I, so, so leave them with this wonderful experience mentally and physically with the crescendo at its high, and then follow up and say, Hey, how'd you have a good time? And then your follow-up is what else can we do? What else can we talk about? How else can we get you connected? How, you know, that's the next steps. The mic drop, right? The whole yeah. mic drop, right? We're done. And then that leaves the door open for that follow-up communication, which I, I think Ben was right in his point that, yeah, oh my gosh, that vet is over. Thank God I'm exhausted. Take a day off or you know, going to go do yoga for a little bit, clear my brain. And now what am I working on next? When it is day one, it's day one to, to thank you promised to, to ask you to share results. And so that little segment of that, there's still something left over. There's still something that we, that we need to do to close this out. It's not, it's not the event closing date time. Yeah. Right. And, ben, and Ben, to your point, if you put all of your effort into a physical event, you're, you're, you're so physically tired about putting on the event. You set up, you tear down, you do checkout, and you're bringing things back to the office. In a virtual world, you're just there to, to put on the show because you did all the heavy lifting prior to so that your day one starting, you can be refreshed. You don't necessarily have to tear down for three days and then get all your organized. It's already done. And now you can hit the ground running and that will be the difference maker in, in comparison to other events and other people who do events than you. Well, for sure. And you're, you're in real time communication via chat, via text or real time communication yeah. with those donors who pre-committed then delivered on event night. Their name is in lights. Everyone can see giving inspires more giving. And that big celebration of hitting the goal or better yet, surpassing the goal creates a peak experience. People remember peak experiences. They bond over peak experiences and they're doing it together. And I'm telling you uh, what what a joy it is to see people just giving together on line absolutely fired up to to, to march forward. I mean, I, I think it's great. And <clears throat> it's funny, you talked about the tearing down, boy, the tear down after a live event. One of uh, one of the early jokes early in the pandemic, we finished an online event. I said, well, uh, by the way, as we say goodnight, if there's a, a few of you want to hang around and help us pick these uh, programs up off the floor and take these centerpieces home, we would appreciate that. Everybody was like, thank goodness we don't have to do that this year. <laughs> Isn't that the great, I, just, just to get a, a real quick other point to follow up with that too. And I've, I've heard a lot of this from nonprofits and uh, organizations who put on events is what's the value we can give our sponsors. That's one of the things that in a virtual environment, they are just insistent. Like well, I can't give enough value. You can't, you can give exponential value to your sponsors in a virtual setting way more than you could in in-person. And, and so if you are prepping the event, you're right. You're like, hey, thanks to these sponsors who are going to help us. Night of, you got uh, in, a, in an in-person event, you throw up their logo on a screen. It's the last you hear of them ever again. And they might be in the program book, but you left that program book by the bar. You left it by a silent auction item. You don't see it anymore. You don't get to see the ads. You don't pay attention to that stuff. That's it. 
But what you do in a virtual event is you get to have that scrolling bar that constantly reminds people of who's sponsoring this segment and videos of commercials of other organizations that have helped you achieve. And then after the event, this is what I think a lot of nonprofits don't think about enough, which is how do you take segments of what was a wonderful event and have those segments replayed on all of your social and in your e-newsletters brought to you by the same sponsors that helped you with the event going forward. It's an added value on top of an added value on top of an added value. You're stacking all of the eyeballs on top of the sponsors who only thought they were going to get a logo on a giant uh, screen behind something that they didn't pay attention to because they were up at the bar getting a drink. But now you have the attention of your audience who wants to say thank you to the awesome businesses who made that possible. And now you can go back to your businesses and ask for more money because you're giving them more value and more eyeballs on the whole thing. That's what I mean about thinking outside of the box and not doing the same thing over and over again. It's not, again, burning down the whole system. It's thinking differently and enthusiastically about giving value and thinking differently about how we can expose those who uh, help us with our mission and our cause and our enthusiasm and our momentum building. It's just such a great place to be right now as a fundraiser and especially as an event planner. Oh, for sure. And, you know, uh, when you talk about sponsors, right, if you're sponsoring and you buy a table and you've got eight seats at the table, you've got eight seats at the table. If you're sponsoring an online event and you want to communicate, like just as Steve Johns did, communicating to everyone at one cause, this is what we stand for. This is what we believe in. We're going to be offering these grants to to nonprofits who apply. If you're a business and you can say, listen, these are the these are the charities we believe in in our community to improve our community. We want you, our workforce, our colleagues to show up as a an entire, you know, not that there's any pressure to do that, but we're, it's an invitation to join us. Our sponsorship gets you a seat at this virtual table and you're sitting right there with your with your leadership and with your colleagues. And what a great way for them to participate. And, you know, Don, we heard from uh, some millennial experts where they're looking for impact. They're looking for a way to participate and they know they want to be working for a company that cares. What if this is not a great way to join your company in supporting local charities? We also talked about, you know, online um, reduces that barrier of entry and expands your your audience base, right? If you're having an in-person event, somebody's not going to necessarily, if you're, you know, based on the East Coast, they're not coming from the West Coast to attend your event. But when you bring it online, you really could broaden that reach and build that donor database change your messaging a little bit to speak to all different generations. You can have multi-messaging, you know, at, on a, in, a, in a virtual, um, uh, you know, experience. And you have a before, during, and after. A four-hour event is a four-hour event, but online can live forever. So I just think that there's incredible opportunities. And, you know, I hope that this, this discussion maybe, you know, curbs that par- paralysis just a little bit so that we're a little bit more open to it. Because as Patrick said, you know, the most dangerous thing that you can do is just keep doing things the way you used to do them. Well, so think about how inclusive that an, a virtual event can be with businesses and their uh, employees, right? You buy a table of eight, you can only bring eight people, probably four people and their dates. So you're getting four people from a business to show up at an event you paid full price for a table with. Or you can have a watch party at your office, in your boardroom, in your activities room that you get to invite your entire company to, to your entire company now gets to be a part of the organization that you're supporting. And all of a sudden you've got new voices, new perspective, new eyeballs and new ears on a mission that your business loves and adores and wants to support. You think as a nonprofit, you don't want that. Or do you want the four people that they, and half of those people are just butts and seats because the other two people couldn't make it because they couldn't find a babysitter and nobody had shoes and nobody could come. Or you get the eyeballs on everybody. It doesn't make sense why you would want one over the other. I, I totally agree. Look, I'm getting carried away here. We could keep talking for an hour, but I got to tell you, I've got to jump in here because we're getting close to our time. And we've asked all of our guest speakers, our experts to share one bit of advice. One thing you've shared a lot of great tools right here. But if if someone's listening in and they say, I got to do one thing, I got to do it tonight, I got to do it tomorrow. What's that one bit of advice they can hold on to from you, uh, Patrick, to help them just stay energized, staying awesome, staying fired up, staying creative and innovative um, that they can start right here, right now? Pick up the phone. 
pick up the phone, call a donor, call the donor who's given to you, call a donor who hasn't given to you in a long time and say, thanks. Say, we couldn't have done this without you. How are you doing? That's it. That's how you motivate your entire day. Because if you pick up the phone and they answer, all of a sudden you're not asking them for money. You're not asking them for any piece of information. You're just saying hi, saying thanks. We wanted to share this with you. Their energy level will inspire you. Your energy will then increase. Your desire to talk to more people will increase. And of course, you talking to more people gets you to tell your story more people, which means more people will be connected to your mission, which means more people will want to give, which means more people will build relationships with you to raise more money. Pick up the phone. Don, pick up the phone. What do you say? Sound uh, makes sense? Um, tomorrow morning. That's the first thing I'm going to do. Uh, you know, it, it's true, though, because it leads to conversations. If you're just thanking them and sure. letting them know we couldn't do it without them, as Patrick is saying, and just striking up that conversation and, and you're not asking you know, I, I, I bet then the offer is going to come like, oh, so what do you need? You know, do, do, do you need anything further? Can I volunteer donations? What do you got coming? I mean, it's just opening up conversations that are limitless at this point. Yes. Well, absolutely love it. And uh, sad to say now, Fearless Fundraisers, that's about all the time we've got for today. Oh, uh, I want to thank you for sad. listening. <laughs> I mean, I can't believe it. I just they can't believe the time is flying, but it's an absolute blast. And um, uh, make sure you hang with us for our future conversations. I want to thank you for listening today, of course. We hope you enjoyed this Raise Nation topic, your daily dose of fundraising inspiration. I'd like to thank our sponsors, One Cause, for making this episode possible. One Cause is driving the future of fundraising with easy-to-use software solutions that help nonprofits connect with donors. Be sure to check them out at onecause.com. A big thanks to my co-host, Don Lego. Thank you so much for joining us again today. And a big shout out to our guest, Patrick. Let me tell you what. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, before we go, how can they best connect with you so they can um, learn more about how you can help them? Sure. Uh, you can go to dogoodbetterconsulting.com or find me on uh, Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm at uh, usually the handle fundraising dad. Uh, or you can find me on Facebook at DGB Consulting. We'll see you online. It's going to be fun. And then reach out, please. I love helping. I love answering questions. I am uh, a fan of just helping people get over the hump or having that light bulb moment happen. So uh, get a hold of me, see how I can help, and uh, would be really happy to connect anywhere. Well, thank you. We are incredibly, incredibly grateful for your time today, your expert uh, advice today. So thank you. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, everybody, this has been Benjamin Farrell, and this is Raise Nation Radio. So stay fearless out there, everybody. One Cause is the proud sponsor of Raise Nation Radio and your daily dose of fundraising inspiration. One Cause is driving the future of fundraising with easy-to-use software solutions that help nonprofits connect with donors. Day in and day out, One Cause puts your cause at the center of everything they do. Let One Cause power your fundraising.